Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Poisons and Pestilence podcast, The French Connection with Etienne Acutia. Uh, Etienne, it's, it's wonderful to have you back on the show today. Our, our listeners will recall that uh, an episode or two back, we had a wander through the establishment of the and the evolutionary roots of the French biological and chemical weapon programs. And in particular, uh, we focused on a central figure in that program. Old Trier, which I mispronounced the entire episode. I'm very grateful that you. Uh, I think um, you did well. It was tr- I said Trillat a lot, which not only revealed my uh, Englishness, <laughs> but always revealed my Englishness, but also my uh, Midlands uh, history in terms of the pronunciation. But today we're going to move and look at post Second World War and look at this French program. Um, which, let's be honest, I think historically has been quite neglected in many of the mainstream histories. Of course, you had a gargantuan uh, Russian program that would emerge post Second World War. Uh, the Americans also had a substantial program. The British uh, were engaging in some some very questionable field experiments in different parts of the world. But the French, of course, in this context, not to be outdone, also move towards re-establishing a chemical and biological war program post-1945. So let's start, I guess, at the end of the Second World War and what that program, or what remains of it, looked like at that point in history. Yes, indeed, and thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be back as well on your uh, on your show in this year, 2024. Indeed, the, yeah, the, the, although France was uh, really uh, uh, defeated during the Second World War, and so the had uh, to stop any most of its activities in the in this area of uh, chemical and biological warfare. The as we saw the we talked about the last time, the um, program remained discreetly done, discreetly searched uh, in Centre d'Etudes du Boucher, the station de, which was named Station d'Essai du Boucher, uh, south of Paris, during the war, and so the. Capacity, the research capacities were not destroyed and uh, started again really soon after the, the end of the war. And the nuclear, biological, and chemical programs began again, firstly with the creation of the CEVA, Commissariat Energie Atomique, in 1945, and in parallel with the creation of a commission, a mixed civilian and, uh, and military commission, in 1947, in charge of defense against biological, chemical, and nuclear warfare. Of course, the Nagasaki and uh, and Hiroshima bombing were very strong incentives to to study and to uh, and to understand those weapons that began to be called in France special weapons. To the point that it was uh, an institutional name. Um, in France, that as we're going to see, I, I think later, an inter-army commander of special weapons. So in the beginning, the so right after the the the, the Second World War, there was um, this uh, an interest again in the biological and chemical warfare. And as I recall, it had the discovery of, of the extent of the Japanese program, mm-hmm. which had a, a research station out in Manchuria. Uh, and which has conducted, of course, uh, barbaric human experiments and, and also caused regional disease outbreaks. Of course, as, as happens with these things, many of those Japanese scientists seem to have found their ways without punishment into American universities. The US, I think, had been doing work on Botox. More generally, of course, you'd had the atom bomb used, and so there was this push within states without the atom bomb I know, for example, in the UK case, you know, we were eager to develop atomic weapons, but 
it was a few years out, even for us, with our close relationship with the US. And we'd actually sent people out for the Manhattan Project. But even with that, we were talking about stopgap weapons, stopgap UMDs to cover the gap, this gap between the development of our own domestic capability. And so the idea of having this as a measure, I guess, primarily against the Soviets. Um, the Germans, of course, both the Western allies and Russia have found out all about what the Germans have been up to in the area of nerve agents. And we, again, acquired some of their stocks and took them back to the West as part of a stopgap measure. The other thing we're interested in too were the delivery systems. So the, the Nazis had developed these V1, V2 weapon systems. And I'm assuming in France, there was discussion and emphasis on this idea that you know, there have been concerns about aerial delivered chemical weapons and biological weapons in the interwar years, but now this prospect of of rocket delivered weapons. And I guess in France, they had this long history, in particular, of looking at aerosols on clouds and thinking about how they might combine that with these new delivery systems. In that broader context, then, work started on the French program. And as I understand it, as you mentioned, there was a domestic aspect of this, domestic civilian and military institutions. But there was also vaccine work, at least, in colonial France. Is that right? Yes, yeah, in the 1940s, middle, mid-40s as well. Uh, but yeah, before that, yeah, the, the, the interest in uh, biological warfare against crops is very present at this time. And... This topic ranges from uh, from the, the the early conceptions of the biological warfare program in France, and I think elsewhere as well. But um, so yeah, there's a mention in the in my book about the the use of uh, of destruction of Japanese crops by the U.S. during the war, and uh, so this is not documented. I don't know, but it's, it's not elsewhere than in the in the the brochure I, I cite in the book. But it's, it's uh, what's inter- interesting, I think, is the mention of uh, of that fact that herbicides and the destruction of crops is uh, considered in biological warfare very seriously as a means to destroy, uh, to wage total warfare and destroy the resources of the populations. So agriculture is, is in uh, in many ways at the, the center of interest in this in these debates and it's also it's, it's an interesting in my view because it concerns the intersection of both biology and chemistry, in that uh, herbicides and pesticides uh, are uh, chemical, are also can also be used as chemical weapons, mm-hmm. as it, as was was uh, chloropicrine, for instance, in the from the First World War. But also the use of insects as well. Research was done in the French program, on the biological warfare program, about the uh, keratinophagus because they could be very useful to destroy completely textiles and uh, also to destroy uh, crops. So in this way, and it's not something that we frequently speak about in the contemporary understanding of biological warfare, the mechanical properties of insects and of animals were at this time concern- considered relevant. So what I'm saying is that biological warfare was not only concerned with poisoning, using biology for poisoning, but also using biology to understand what mechanical properties of living beings could can be used to wage war. That's one aspect, and yeah, so indeed the, there was an interest in that and what had happened during the, the, the war. Knowledge about, about viruses in biology and about also nuclear science was also very, very limited, and people searched in this commission, 1947 commission, inquired about the vaccine against radioactivity, for instance. They were also trying to understand what what had been done by the Germans in this area, and particularly particularly in the area of uh, chemical warfare, and about taboon and sarin gases, which were called at the time trilons. It was a code name. It was the name of an of a water softener in the, in the at this time. It was a name used to to misinform intelligence services. Also, the self delivery including the V1 and V2 uh, rockets were also considered and after afterwards um, studied as uh, and tested in France as, as means to deliver chemical weapons. 
Pierre's legacy was also was still present, although he died in 1944. But Michel Mashbeuf, the uh, director of the biological chemistry uh, section at Institut Pasteur at the time, mentioned him and was inspired by him and wrote an obituary about him in uh, 1947, so uh, three years after his death. And uh, he was very much involved in this commission, was the, the main representing figure of, of the Institut Pasteur and this commission. And so what's interesting in these years is that, that we can see that link between the civilian sphere and the military sphere is very liberal and they speak freely and openly of the of the issues at stake. The army gives information to the scientists that they that will not be given later to them, like uh, in, in intelligence about the uh, the knowledge of the U.S. program that they had, for instance, about the awareness that the U.S. was considering anthrax agent as a good candidate, and that the Germans projected to to use anthrax bombs during the the the, the, the Second World War and things like that, things that the scientists didn't know. But that they came to know through this uh, this commission. The commission itself was secret, but inside was very uh, pluralistic. So yeah, so Trias' legacy was about the aerosols and clouds and the understanding of, of, of the the course of epidemics and the and medical me- meteorology, which was a big part of the projected research in this uh, 1947 commission. Indeed, among the the civilian applications of the research done at this time was the research on poly vaccines, the way to, to give immunity to several pathogens at the, at once, which was done experimentally on military staff in Tunisia at the same time. Yeah. It was done uh, through the network of the Institute Pasteur, which was a network that spanned the whole uh, colonial area. So Institute Pasteur indeed was a very convenient institution. It gathered all scientists that could be uh, involved in the biological and chemical warfare. They had the knowledge which the military lacked. And as many of them are understood at this time in this in the in this commission, is that the scientific community in France had to be rebuilt as well. Not only the the facilities and the the, the military uh, research, but also the civilian research. So I get I got the sense from this nineteen forty seven to nineteen fifty six period that there was a very broad and open sense of what biological and chemical warfare could be. There was a growing sense of these important dimensions that were emerging in different programs globally or had emerged during the Second World War. There was also this emergence of distinction between biological and chemical weapons and organizational terms, so it was both broadening and deepening in terms of sophistication and division of labor. And as you mentioned, there was also this illusion of ideas such as ecological warfare and the role of ectomology as an aspect of biological warfare and this was all tied to public health and defensive work, which had already been occurring. So, as I understand it, there was vaccine work in Tunisia on typhoid and paratyphoid. So, I assume, much like in the UK, there, be, there would have been ethical contention since in relation to this work. Well, I think the ethical standards at the time, although there was, uh, the, I mean, the Nuremberg, uh, the the Nuremberg. Um trials of the Nazi uh, biologists and, and uh, medical doctors was really recent. It's, it's 46. Um, yeah, so these standards so these standards were, were not really in place and uh, experiments, uh, human experiments uh, were not uh, regulated and this was uh, internal military and uh, so it was not that surprising. I mean, that volunteer military would be used through us to best out to, to be tested on the, on a poly vaccine. Yeah. I knew troops that were volunteered for, were, or were volunteered. And that mirrors what happened in the UK, in, in India, for example, there was, there was mm-hmm. work which occurred, um, 
that they didn't follow like uh, modern protocols or uh, clinical trials as we currently uh, do. So this initial period then, sort of 47 to 56, was a very, I guess, aspirational time in which there really was this very broad, encompassing and forward-looking and ambitious sense of the work that could be done in this area and the extent to which it was, could be based on rapid advances in the area of biotechnology and chemistry as, as well. As I understand it, though, and this, I guess, again, reflects what was happening among the Allied, Western Allies post-Second World War, there was a general decline in interest in these weapons from about 1956 in, in France. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why these weapons seem to start to fall out of favour and interest waned from about 56 onwards. Yeah, at this time emerges the distinction between uh, chemical and biological weapons. In, or, uh, I mean, uh, technically, uh, it was not the case in France before. Uh, the notion of virus was indeed characterized really precisely by André Lvov in, in, uh, in 1957, the structure of DNA, as you know, by 1953, etc. So this, this period was uh, ambitious in terms of understanding the chemical and biological warfare. And the and the science needed to understand that. Uh, and once the once the science was there, the civilians were uh, kicked out of the of the programs uh, gradually. The discussion became increasingly secret. Uh, in 1953, this uh, the 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 1947 medical commission uh, was uh, reformated or transformed, and it it uh, included two times less civilians and it's it, it's lost its autonomy it used to be beginning quite autonomous but six years later it was not anymore and uh, the growing there was a growing environmental concern about what uh, what will what could be the effects of biological and chemical warfare uh, it was the case also in nuclear warfare about the fallouts as well, and the the after the aftermath of the of the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were known later, but also uh, that that had some uh, repercussions on the on the thinking about chemical and biological warfare. In the central figure in this of this concern in front was Colonel Jude, which I quote a lot in the book. The emergence of the idea of uh, weapons of mass destruction and enough possibility of uh, ecological uh, impacts of, of biological, chemical, and nuclear warfare is, is present. It grows until 1956 in favor, in fact, of, of uh, working on uh, nuclear warfare because it becomes at the center of research with a, a slight decline of interest in biological and chemical warfare at by the end of the, the 50s. In that early period, you also, because of the openness, one imagines as you approach the 60s, there was a greater likelihood that aspects of the, the science, open scientific community would be less willing to work on certain type of program. And as you say, environmental issues are becoming more to the fore. So this later period from 56 to 76, it would make sense that this program was, was more closed off in some respect because you didn't necessarily have that wartime perspective of the role of science and service of the military and those type of thing. So as I understand it, you know, around 57, CBW was seen as increasingly less effective and desirable as opposed to having a, a sort of nuclear deterrent or alternative nuclear forms of weapon it could be utilized in warfare but seemingly at odds with this and around 1962 the french did begin that or decide to begin developing their own biological warfare arsenal is that right yes yeah, simultaneously we have the 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 creation of well there's a commission in 52 that is created is the commission on chemical and biological studies and experiments. There's there's a regular there's a 
organizational transformations at this time. So in 52, there's, there's this interest in chemical and biological studies and experience, but the interest in chemical and biological warfare, uh, gradually erodes, erodes from, um, 1952 after the creation of this, uh, commission on the chemical and biological studies and experience. And the central figure in this, uh, erosion of the interest is uh, Charles Ayre, General Ayre, who states and, and thinks that, uh, w, that biological and chemical warfare are not WMDs, uh, whereas nuclear, nuclear weapons are. And, um, he becomes in 1958, the inter-army commander of special weapons, who's a, some kind of joint, uh, chief of staff for, for uh, chemical and biological warfare. Which puts, puts him in a position to 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 control all research on uh, not on unconventional weapons in France, and this focus on uh, on nuclear warfare is really important at the time because France doesn't have the bomb, and he authorized the first test of a French nuclear bomb, Jarboise Bleu, in the Algerian Sahara on uh, February thirteenth, nineteen sixty. So the it's really the period, the end of the 50s is really the period in which interest for chemical and biological warfare erodes. And, uh, and it starts again at the beginning of, uh, of the 1960s, a, a renewed interest in 62 with the awareness that the U S has an interest in this, uh, in these weapons and, uh, has not lost interest in, in these weapons, the weapon with collaboration with the USA and, and the Netherlands. Subtitle of my book is kind of a teaser because the, the, the knowledge and the, and the, and, and the techniques are coming from the U S and not going to the, <laughs> um, yeah. So this, uh, this collaboration, uh, involves, uh, improving laboratory and, uh, and, uh, infrastructure, particularly concerning the safe handling of neurotoxics. Also, the Dutch experience in this area is uh, uh, is interesting for the for the French program. And as I understand, the French also had an interest in incapacitants. Is that is that right? Yeah. Well, uh, the incapacitants. The, there's a, f a focus on Asia in the capacity that is that is uh, uh, suggested by the by the uh, the French Ministry of Defense, but this interest. Is not is not followed by actions. The interest remains on lethal weapons. It's interesting here thinking about this. Obviously, the U.S. was the, the major player among the would would be NATO forces, and I'm, I know that after joy the war there was significant work between Canada, the U.K., and the U.S. And, and following the Second World War, this division of labor to some extent continued between. The UK's understood role, and that's of its major partner, the US. And I hadn't, I haven't seen much work which has actually looked in detail at partnership between France and the US in this area. And I, I guess this program in this era can only really be understood as an aspect of that. How much? I think there's there's a big uh, research to be done on that topic because it's really there's nothing to be found is, except for some of the mentions that I mean I I, I don't uh, I've not seen the the mention of the this mutual weapons development data exchange program that I'm I'm uh, mentioning in this in in the book. I don't know if there's any research that has been done on the subject uh, in between. And one also suspects that there may be greater availability of documentation on the French program in the US archives and the current years yeah, that that was very likely in the French archives. That was very likely, but that was indeed a um, yeah. That would be I think it would be a very interesting relationship to, to follow up for those people out there if they're interested I, I think there's uh likely to be fruits there um now as in again in the uk from the 1960s onwards you have a re the beginning of a restructuring of the french defense industry and specifically in relation to work on pathogens and aerosols and see increasing privatization and while it seems that, you know, offensive work is not so out of vogue, but not necessarily a priority 
there is certainly a lot more work on what could be considered dual use or defensive work, including animal research from the mid sixties onwards. And also reading the book, there was also seen to be some perennial problems with some of these extramural sites in Algeria and, and handling and building those and whether they were worth maintaining or in, investing. But there were also a, a series of testing of tests that were planned. What was that Algeria? Is, is that correct? The, uh, was it spice test? There was this discussion of the French needing on, on that. So I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what those tests were and, and what they, yeah, what they involved. Yeah, indeed, there was, uh, of course, a great need of uh, model animals, as uh, you mentioned, uh, to test all these weapons, chemical and biological weapons, because, uh, because of course, uh, those could not be tested uh, on uh, humans, as this was uh, really, uh, as I said, it's completely immoral and not doable. It, it was done at some, at some uh, periods of time, but... Uh, including in the, in the Japanese program, but not in the French program, uh, and not after the Second World War. And in the in the sixties, there was many many questions about how to continue testing, particularly uh, rockets with chemical weapons in Algeria, because the Algerian war uh, was going on uh, since the mid fifties to the to nineteen sixty two. When the uh, the Avian Accords or Asia Agreements were signed, so all testing facilities in Algeria, because there was several where nuclear weapons were tested as well, they they closed at the at the end of the Algerian War, so the decolonization war uh, in Algeria. It was considered in France at the time a civilian war because it was internal to France. Algeria was considered a uh, French territory, but in fact we now call it the Algerian War. So many, many other sites were considered as candidate sites for the continuation of those tests, including uh, French Guiana or rocket tests, uh, also the uh, Toulouse area and the uh, Bourges region, uh, it's a French city in central France. But the Avian Accords of 1962, so the agreement between the uh, free Algeria, free Alg Algerian government, the Algerian Republic, and uh, France included the special understanding about the continuation of uh, chemical warfare tests in uh, western Algeria, in the desert, close to the, the border of Morocco. So this led to a series of testing until the mid-70s. I don't know the exact uh, reasons why the Algerian government allowed the French to keep doing this, but I suppose there was an exchange of information as well. I'd be fascinated to try and pull up some of the Algerian news articles and archives on this, because it sounds like, as with other experiment areas in this era, they were secret. In this case, they involved a private company. They also were secret, but because of incidents, would have come to local knowledge, and they also would have been provided for by local individuals and groups, so they would have been known about. And it sounds like, in addition to the kind of administrative challenges of running a remote base, there certainly seems to have been some reputational management uh, requires uh, these sites, which would have uh, attracted public concern. And I think the company was called, I've got it here, Sodeteg, would be S-O-D-E-T-E-G. And so potentially yeah. uh, that might be another area that would uh, benefit from even more research into the... Algerian experience in relation to the friendly programs. And in addition to that, I understand that just before uh, France was involved in the negotiation of the Biological Toxic Weapons Convention of 1972, there were also additional works on sarin and sarin defense testing involving rockets, uh, which one would expect, you know, even if not interested in the offensive side, it may have also been you know, work designed to test masks and other forms of defense. 1972, of course, we see the uh, negotiation of the BTWC, the prohibition of you know, testing development and stockpiling of biological weapons. But it appears that defensive work seems to have continued, at least at the NAMOS site, and work with that, that private body in defensive capacity 
also seems likely to have continued. And I guess you, as with me, I mean, obviously in your book, you, you cover a vast time period, but this French-Algerian relationship and the fate of this site is something that still, I think, merits further study and for lots of different reasons. And so, so yeah, I think that's a, a really fascinating history that is yet to be fully uh, explored or may already be explored, but not yet translated. Yeah, so yeah. this is your, indeed the, the, the very existence of the Sodetec company that you mentioned was discovered in, uh, in 1998 by a French journalist, Vincent Jauvert, from a French newspaper, uh, Le Nouvel Observateur. I don't know how he, he came to he came across the archives, but he understood that there was this, uh, this test facility in Algeria that kept being active until, and he says, until 1978. I have evidence until 1975. So he doesn't provide right archives, but just, he's, he's, it's a it's a, a newspaper article about it. But he understands that this company Sodetec is a, is a shell company for the French uh, government or uh, like a publicly owned company. And people locally don't really have an idea of what's going on, uh, except for some events like uh, sheep owners who lose their, their sheep uh, in 1966 and complain are refunded by the French government. Um, and of course, this is something that happened in the UK on Grenard. Uh, there was a, an incident where local sheep got infected by anthrax, I think it was, and yeah. they got they yeah. got yeah. Uh, I think uh, Dugway, is it Dugway? Sure. Or, yeah. There was also an incident there. So I guess that this is a really interesting way of wrapping up this episode, and one in which we can perhaps enlist the help of listeners today who fancy a bit of three thing to help us understand what the fate of this work which occurred in what was then Algeria. This is Sodeteg, S-O-D-E-T-E-G. I'd be really interested if people could dig anything up on this. Please do send either of us an email about that and we'll get back to you because this seems like one of those issues which for various historical reasons has probably been marginalised in public discussion. It may certainly be things of general interest there which we do merit public discussion so if anyone can shine a light on this do please let us know yeah there was also there was tests test that kept, kept on until the i mean from the archives I, i've consulted until 1975 uh test of rockets and shells but with chemical uh chemicals inside not uh, not biological agents not anthrax for instance also because uh, chemical weapons were not uh, regulated in the same way as internationally as uh, as biological weapons were. So it was still legal, in fact, until 1993 to experiment on offensive uh, chemical weapons. It was not as regulated as it became after the 1990s. And so this was it's not completely astonishing. And also for, uh, of course, as you said, for, for prophylactic reasons and to understand how to to prevent and uh, create medical countermeasures against chemical warfare. These tests was also were also performed. The, I mean, protection equipment was also tested in Algeria. It was not only uh, dangerous weapons. Yeah, and uh, actually, many testing uh, uh, campaigns were uh, using uh, mock agents. And we know, for example, um, throughout the 60s and 70s, there was very, very large-scale testing of model agents. This included by the US and by, and by the UK that we are aware of, so things like cadmium sulfide and other large-scale, even very, very large area release and then detection of, of certain agents. We had Mike Kenner, I think speak was probably our first guest on the show about some of the trials that occurred around the southwest of England, uh, which involved model agents which were used in place of pathogens or chemical warfare agents to test how well they spread. And one imagines that the French, considering with their long term interest in area biology, uh, would have had a particular uh, interest in open air testing. So no, it's a really interesting dimension. Uh, representative of the Algerian 
military, Rashid Benyev, uh, that uh, this uh, campaign, this uh, this test of chemical and biological weapons, have been done until 1986. He argued that in a book, uh, in a, a 2017 book, in his memoirs, that the, the, the French continued to test chemical and biological warfare uh, uh, weapons in the desert in, until 1986. This Rachid Benyel was a central figure of uh, the Algerian power because he was the, the, the commander of the, the Marine, then a sec uh, uh, Secretary of State for the Ministry of Defense until uh, from 1984. So his, uh, his testimony is not to be... Uh, disregarded I think in this area although of course it's just like there's no empirical evidence about this but yeah I think a link also that is not to be disregarded is the one with the, the chemical weapons program in uh, Iraq of course the, is this uh, there was uh, there was uh, friendly relationships between uh, the French government and the Iraqi government. It's, I think it's also an interesting lead to do research on uh, on the continuation of and the and the the networks around Sodetek. Fantastic. So I guess um, all that leaves me to say uh, today is to thank you very much for coming on. And I, as ever, I've got a lot out of that, and I I, I really do suggest those of an interest to go and locate and get hold of your your book um i understand that you're also at the moment working on something which is of particular contemporary interest and that is uh trilla 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 <laughs> who uh, we discussed a lot in the first episode we did his work on on the spanish influenza of 1918 so at the moment that's something you're working on Indeed, I did. I'm working. I, I just submitted an article on this, on the the role of Tria in the understanding of uh, the in the Spanish in the so-called Spanish influenza epidemic during the the First World War. Nobody knew exactly what the agent was because uh, viruses were not known at the time. But Tria was uh, among the the scientists who. Uh, worked on showing that this epidemic was transmis uh, transmittable through the air. And he did uh, an experimental transmission of influenza to the ferret. So uh, this, all, in... uh, this, of course, is important because this all relates to the dual-use research debates we have now at UCL yeah. and all that. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much for coming on and look after yourself. And I hope to speak to you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brett, and uh, I hope to speak to you too soon.